This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, this is Lar Park Lincoln, Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey, bad news crews, Tommy has a joke for you. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed hard sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. And I am so excited for today's show because I will be talking to, and this interview has been seven years in the making, I will be talking to Tracy Savage, yes, Debbie from Friday the 13th in 3D or Part 3, depending on which version you saw. And she will be my fourth guest from the movie, and I am so friggin' excited. You know, Tracy was always my favorite girl in that movie, and she had a career, you know, long before that as a child actress. I mean, she was in, you know, uh, she was on, she was on classic shows like My Three Sons, Little House on the Prairie, where she was Christy Kennedy. She had a, she was in a bunch of episodes of Family with Christy McNichol. She was in The Devil of Max Devlin. She was on one of my favorite episodes of Happy Days. And then after Friday the 13th Part 3, she left acting and went into journalism, and she covered everything from the O.J. Simpson trial to the Heidi Fleiss trial, the 1996 Summer Olympics, the Oklahoma City Unabomber case. I mean, God, she's seen it all, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her if you know she sees it that way, if she's, if she's seen it all. And it's going to be a great conversation today. I cannot wait. And uh, shout out to Greg Gilbert, who helped facilitate this interview. Thank you, Greg. Also, rest in peace, Ron Thompson. Uh, another one bit the dust. The great character actor you all know as Tony and Pete Belinsky and Ralph Bakshi's rotoscope animation classic, American Pop. He was just one of those zelly character actors who had been around forever. You know, he rocked American Pop you know, through that rot- rotoscope animation, and he was a huge supporter of mine, we did a great interview on January 12th, uh, 2021, you can go check that out, it's wonderful, and he tried connecting me with a few people, I'm going to miss his reaction notifications on my Facebook page and my Tommy Kovac podcaster group, love you Ron, thanks man. So yeah, here is my interview with Tracy Savage. Hey, Tracy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great, Tommy. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Yes, nice to meet you, too. I can't tell you what a great honor this is. I'm so glad that um, Greg could uh, finally make this happen. So thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Happy, Happy to be here. Happy to do it. Awesome. So... Going back in time, um, I know that um, your mother was a, a talent long, agent. Long time, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I said we're going back a long, long time. Long, long time. Yes. Yeah. So I know that your mother was a talent agent, and you started acting at age two. Did it start with commercials? Well, um, we were living in Detroit, Michigan, and mm-hmm. um, we got an agent. And I think the first few things I did as a toddler, <laughs> were like print jobs, um, mm-hmm. you know, like modeling, little little jobs for like a department store and yeah. a, uh, like an auto dealer and that kind of thing. But my first, car comer- my first commercial I did at two years old was for a car commercial uh, in Detroit, Michigan, nice. uh, American Motors Rambler uh, car. And um, I did a few of those little ones in Michigan before we moved to Los Angeles when I was six years old. Wow, so the auto industry was what it originally was until Michael Moore had to make that documentary, Roger and Me, years later. Uh, well, that's so funny you say that. I was actually working in Flint, Michigan. Um, I, I went to college in Ann Arbor, mm-hmm. Michigan, and so I know all about um, Roger and Me, and yeah, um, yeah that's pretty funny. Oh, that's crazy, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, your brother Brad, he also started probably around uh, at age two, right? Yeah, he started a very young, you know, he, he might have been younger than me. Um, you know, doing commercials and little print modeling jobs. And when we moved to Los Angeles, uh, he was only, I think, maybe 
three. And he worked a little bit, but within a few years, he was working all the time. Nice, nice. Yeah, I remember him from the Apple Dumpling Gang and Red Dawn and all of that. Oh, yeah. Um, he did a lot of Disney movies, um, like back-to-back Disney films. Um, Which Mountain? Yeah, Return yeah. for Which Mountain, uh, No Deposit, No Return. And, um, um, yeah, he worked a lot. He was on a TV series for a few years, The Tony Randall Show. And he did tons of episodic, you know, guest star roles on just a ton of different shows. Yeah, you're, you're both in the same generation as a lot of kid actors I've interviewed, like Robbie Rist and Lisa Lucas and David Pollock and Rodimus Parra, Rachel Longacre, the list goes on and on. Well, Robbie is uh, one of my brother Brad's dear friends. I mean, we've known Robbie. I've known Robbie. Brad's known Robbie since they were five or six years old. And Brad is still in touch with Robbie all these years later. Yeah, he's a funny, funny guy. <laughs> oh, he is. Love him. Hilarious. One of your first TV show appearances was as Ronnie Shell's niece on Love American Style. I just had Ronnie on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's he's 92. He's still sharp and funny. Oh, my God. Well, you know, I was, what, maybe six years old, seven years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I barely even remember working on that show. Um, that's amazing. You have some great trivia. I tell you, you do your homework. Because that's impressive. And then you actually interviewed him recently. Um, wow. Does he live? Is he in Los Angeles still? I believe so, yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm a true fan of, of of everybody that I talk to and stuff. You know? Wow. And that's so, amazing. Good for you. Yeah. Then you did the Mod Squad. Anything stand out about that? Um, not really. It was a pretty small role. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was, you know, maybe six years old. <laughs> yeah. And six or seven years old. Um, it, that was kind of a, a kind of a small part. I did um, uh, Adam Twelve. Mm-hmm. And that that was an interesting role. I played a little girl that had been sexually assaulted, which oh. back in the late late sixties, early seventies was kind of taboo to even talk about on TV in a TV show right and um, and that was Adam 12 and then I did um, several a couple episodes of uh, my three sons yes that I, that I had a pretty big role in as a little girl and I'm still friends with uh, Dawn Lynn who played Dodie oh yeah I heard she's not doing too good well she's doing better actually she she's been sick and um, was in the hospital but she's actually doing much better which is awesome Oh, good, yeah, because um, I've had Tina Cole on twice, and uh, she's posted on uh, Facebook that uh, she spent some time with her recently. Yeah, no, I did too. I just was with Dawn last week, and Tina had been there like three days earlier. Um, and Tina's amazing, and Dawn loves Tina. You know, they're like family. And so that was really wonderful for Tina. I've, I've never met Tina, but I know wonderful things about her from Dawn, and it was so nice that she went and visited Dawn. Uh, she doesn't live in Los Angeles, I don't think, so she, I think she was in town and went and saw her, which was really lovely. Yes, absolutely. Also, uh, Stanley Livingston, I've had him on recently, great guy. Wow, um, wow, wow, that's amazing. And uh, Fred de Cordova directed um, one of those episodes you were on. That was probably one of the last things he did before he took over The Tonight Show. Oh, my God. I'm learning more about my career than I ever knew yeah. <laughs> from you. <laughs> I did not know that. So Fred DeCorvita, um directed one of the episodes that I did? Yeah, the second one. Oh, my God. Wow, that's so interesting. And then he did the Tonight Show right after that for years, right? Oh, yeah, for like over 20-plus years. Wow, that's, that's a cool little six degrees of separation kind of thing right there. <laughs> it sure is. Um, in the 70s, there was a disaster flick craze, both in theatrical movies and TV, and you were in Terror on the 40th Floor. I was, and I was also in Hurricane Hunters, which were both, you know, those kind of, you know, disaster films. Um, and uh, neither one of them were very big roles. I probably worked uh, maybe a day or two on each movie. 
Yeah. But they were movies of the they were movies of the week. They weren't uh, feature films. Yeah. And um, uh, but I remember I think it was Hurricane Hunters. Um, it was a pretty good cast. Um, the actor from Dallas, the main Larry Hagman. Larry Hagman. I think he was in. I think I had spent so many years. I'm sure he was in Hurricane Hunters. Yeah, it was him, Martin Milner, Jessica Walter, Barry Sullivan, Michael Leonard, um, Will Gear, uh, Barry Livingston was in there. Yeah, that's a yeah, great I cast. Remember, I, did, I did work with Barry then. I think he played my big brother. Yeah. He played my big brother. Wow, what a small world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, Tom Leopold was in there back when he was an actor. Uh, Patrick Duffy, wow, that, that's a good cast there. It was. It was. But Terror on the 40th Floor had John Forsyth, and this was before Dynasty, and he was kind of oh. a, a big deal on TV at that point. Yeah, he was. He was, he was. That's, yeah, that was a small role, too. I don't remember too much about working on that show. Um, How about uh, playing Lizzie Borden? <laughs> I do remember that pretty well. Um, because at the time, I was uh, uh, under contract with Little House on the Prairie, mm -hmm. and I was doing, um, you know, working on that show, and um, when I got cast to play Elizabeth Montgomery as a little girl, they wanted me to have red hair, and I was sort of a sandy blonde, you know, kind of brownish, blondish color, wasn't red, and so um, I really couldn't dye my hair to match hers because... Um, it, I, I was under contract and it would have messed up my hair. Yeah. So um, I wore a wig. I wore a, a kind of a bright red wig for that uh, for that show. And um, that's a kind of a classic, you know, yeah. movie that that uh, you know even to this day still gets attention. Uh, and Elizabeth Montgomery was brilliant in it. She really did a great job. Yeah, she she actually was um, actually a distant cousin of Lizzie Borden. I read. Well, there you go. So it's all in the family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you were so adorable with the red hair, and you had that oh. e that evil look on your face. I, I love it. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was it. Was fun. It was, I, I remember it well, and it was creepy too. You know, even though you know, obviously it's a film, and we're just make believe, but. You know, the, there's a, the, someone lying on the table, basically pretending to be dead, and you know, that was, it was kind of a creepy movie. Do you remember anything about the director Paul Wenkos? No, I don't. I don't. Yeah, a couple actresses. A couple actresses have me tooed him on this podcast. Really? Oh wow! What did he go on to do that was famous after that movie? Well, his most famous movie was the first Gidget movie in 1959. Oh wow! Oh, yeah, wow. He was a, he was like an old studio director, you know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And he he did a movie just before this. It was a, it was a horror uh, TV movie that took place on a beach, and I know a few actresses that were in it. Those are the ones that uh, me too him. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's crazy how things were different back still, then. He's not still alive, is he? Oh no, I think he's he, he'd probably be a hundred today. <laughs> Okay, wow. Um, yeah, many remember you as Christy K, the uh, Little House on the Prairie. Uh, like, so that was just a standard audition, and Michael Landon was well, great to work with? It wasn't really. Um, I was I screen tested for the, the lead role of Laura Ingalls, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I didn't get the role. It was between me and Melissa Gilbert. And I was um, I was a few inches taller than Melissa Gilbert, and a few inches shorter than Melissa Sue Anderson, who played Mary. And I was really too close in height to both of them to be, you know, a little sister. Um, I mean, I, I was Melissa Gilbert was a couple of inches shorter, and basically she made a better uh, Laura in terms of height is concerned. Plus, she was a, a really good actress, but. If I, through the years, my entire life, my mom had mentioned when I was younger that, you know, I had screen, and I remember screen testing. I remember working with Michael Landon on the screen test and being really excited. I had read the book, so I knew everything about Laura Ingalls and Little mm -hmm. House. And, um, but all through the years, I, 
been told and been saying that, yeah, I had screen tested for the role and it was between me and Melissa Gilbert. Mm -hmm. But there was a part of me that doubted that. There was a part of me that thought, oh, come on. I'll bet there were five girls on that screen test. Well, yeah. fast forward to about a month ago, I was in Simi Valley for the uh, 50th anniversary of Little House on the Prairie, uh, and I got a chance to catch up with the cast who I haven't seen in, in literally 48 years. And uh, I, I you know, was talking to Melissa Gilbert, and she said, you know, Tracy, I have the um, call sheet from the original screen test. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. That's so cool. Um, I'd love to see that. And she said, well, you know, it was just you and me. And I, my eyes kind of flew open, and I, I'm like, really? You mean that's, that's really true? Like, I just wasn't, I couldn't believe it truly was just between me and Melissa for that lead role. And I, I, when she told me that, I mean, I had, like, I loved my career. I was a broadcast journalist for 30 years after college and right. covered stories all over the world. And uh, now I'm a college professor, and I love my job, and I love my students. I wouldn't change my life for a minute. However, at the time, I really wanted that role. I really wanted to be a Laura Ingalls. And so I turned to Melissa Gilbert, and I said, wow, Melissa, can you imagine how different my, my life would have been if I'd gotten that role, like like just totally different trajectory for 10 years, I'd be on Little House and then who knows where I'd go from there. Yeah. And Melissa, she turned to me and said, imagine how different my life would be because she's basically, you know, that role defined her adulthood even because she was on the show until she was probably, you know, 20 years old and, um, or maybe even 21. And then, you know, she went on to work yeah. after that, but it's really kind of, I don't know, just her life would have been completely different, too. So we but, both kind of laughed hmm. about just how, you know, how life can take these turns, twists and turns, and, um, and you know, the decision, one decision made, you know, put me off in one direction and her off in another. Um, and so it was very, very interesting to, to hear, actually, that it really was between the two of us for that major role. Um, I, I, I was a little blown away by that, and that was just a month ago out in Simi Valley. Yeah, I, 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 her Melissa Gilbert's uh, godparents, Charlie Brill and Missy McCall, have been on the show. Uh, the, uh, her god sister uh, Jenny uh, connected me with them, and they're like. Uh, some of my favorite guests I've ever had. They are hilarious. They were the husband and wife comedy team that went on the Ed Sullivan show right after the Beatles, and they completely bombed. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. You have, you have the best knowledge. Um, you know, here's a little tip or a little. Uh, oh, yeah. Tip. Here's an exclusive. My brothers, I have an older brother and yeah. a younger brother, and the three of us are contemplating. Um, your navels? Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're, no, no, we're contemplating um, um, writing a book. Oh, yeah. Uh, about the three of our, just basically the three savages growing up in Hollywood and about our careers. And um, I swear I should hire you to help us do research because you know more backstory facts and figures that anyone I've ever met. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to, absolutely. Yeah, you guys could like it's each, you, you guys could each have a chapter in the book. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I, yeah, I would be happy to help. Um, Charlotte Stewart, I love her. She's been on the show and I, I did not know what to expect. She's so sweet. And I, her book, I think, had just come out, but I didn't know about it. So I didn't know about her wild Laurel Canyon past. So she, she, she thrillingly shocked me when she swore on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, she's something else. She's, she's dynamic. I, I hadn't seen her in decades. Um, and I love her backstory and I love how, you know, feisty she is and yeah. edgy she is and um, she truly didn't fit, I mean, she was not typecast as this prim little teacher. Yeah. Um, she had spunk and I love that. I, I, I love her, yes. And Michael Landon, people have told me, you know, he was like a spiritual advisor, just like his character on Highway to Heaven. He helped a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, no, he was uh, he was just a phenomenal person, one of the nicest, kindest, 
you know, men and, and lovely, um, lovely to the kids and lovely to the crew and uh, just, a, just a lovely man. I got to meet his two of his kids mm -hmm. that I had never met before. And um, uh, I don't even think they were born 50 years ago. That's probably why I never met them. Yeah. But they were, <laughs> they were, they were super, super sweet. Uh, really, really nice people. Yeah, do you remember anything about Victor French? Um, well, I work with him, but I don't, you know, he was an adult and I was a kid back then, and so we didn't really, you know, connect. I mean, we were in scenes together, a couple, but um, nothing that I that stands out, um, you know, that I, that I remember, really. He, he was one of those guys you don't see anymore, the heavy set, bearded character actor like uh, Sebastian Cabot on Family oh. Affair. You know, yeah. yeah, those guys aren't, aren't, aren't around anymore, sadly. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, oh my God. Tell me about working with Christy McNichol on Family, because I have a Christy McNichol story. Oh my gosh, well, um, Christy and I were basically, you know, competitors in the entertainment industry. We were both child actors, and we'd go on interviews together and compete. Mm -hmm together for years and years and then she wrote she landed that role and I got cast to do I think I did two or three episodes and um, um, you know we were friends we were um, competitors but also friends and uh, you know we're kids in the biz and so it was fun it was actually a fun show to work on because I was sort of hanging out with you know with with my friends yeah, I met her a month before uh, COVID hit at a Comic-Con in the Bay Area, and I was waiting, oh my God, for it. I was anticipating it. My mom never saw me so excited to meet somebody at a con ever as I was with her. And um, we go there, and, and she's there, and I, I just told her, I said, you know, I loved her performance in Just the Way You Are. And I told her, you know, I feel bad that she had, you know, her, her breakdown during that film. That's when she found out she was bipolar, you know, but I love that movie. And it's, it's really lifted me up since I was four when it comes to having a disability. And she said, hey, I, it, that, that was hard for me, but I love that movie. I'm so proud of it. And she whipped out an eight by 10 of her playing violin in the movie or playing flute or yeah, it was flute. And then she signed it for me. And then we, you know, we hugged each other and we took some great pictures. I'm embarrassed by the way I was dressed. But other than that, I loved, I loved that experience. It's, it's my favorite experience. That's, that's so, you know, I've not seen her since we were teenagers. Yeah. Cause, because once I started college uh, at 18, I was pretty much out of the business, except I came back and did Friday the 13th after my first year of college. Yeah. Um, but then that was really the last thing I did because then I went to University of Michigan and got my degree in broadcast journalism and then went on to be a news reporter and I stopped working in the industry until decades later when I'd get hired by film companies to play um, news reporters. I get hired to be a news anchor. Oh yeah. That's what that's what I did for my pretty much my old adult life. And um, so I lost track of a lot of those actors. I'm I'm excited to even hear that they're still around and that you're seeing them out and about at conferences uh, as recently as, you know, five years ago. I, I didn't know Christy was even doing the round. See I do I do cons conventions mm -hmm. for horror because of Friday the 13th. Right. And so um, you really have to be, you know, it's a specific genre. And if you didn't do a horror film, you're not, we're not going to cross paths. Um, yeah, well, there's a there's a chance you might at 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 some you know autograph show signing. You know, I haven't seen her do. I mean, she did do that one horror movie, White Dog, but like other than that, yeah, I haven't seen her booked for horror conventions. Yeah, yeah, and she had a brother, right, Jimmy? Jimmy, yes. Yeah, that's so cool. That's really neat. That one episode you did of, of Family where she's got the alcoholic friend, I interviewed her recently, Carol Jones. She was 22 years old playing 14 in that episode. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Was that the one where I was a journalist at a newspaper and I was, or she was, I'm trying to think, maybe I was the source 
And she was working for the camp, the, the school newspaper. I think that was the, what that episode was about. I think so. There, there may have been the one before that. I can't remember. But I, I do remember seeing you in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. How about the uh, Devil of Max Devlin? You know, I that was a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was now like almost an adult, or I might have been eighteen already. Yeah. And I was getting ready, you know, to leave um, leave the industry and um, and move to Michigan to go to University of Michigan and get a degree. And I pretty much um, I kind of uh, don't remember that much about that movie. I think it was probably a small role, and um, uh, I just honestly, I don't even remember. Yeah, well, it's funny, uh, Rodney Shell is also in the movie. I asked him what it was like. Um, he said he liked working with Elliot Gould, but that, that was yeah, about it. I don't think I had a, the problem is I don't think I had a scene with Elliot Gould. Yeah, I remember seeing this advertised on ABC when I was a kid, and uh, the uh, the announcer, Ernie Anderson, said, Bill Cosby is the devil. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's very true. That's really funny. I know. I, I, I think back on that, too. Um, and it cracks me up. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, you know, people in Hollywood have always had their um, their their sins in plain sight, you know, and this yeah. is definite one of those uh, situations. You were in one of my top three favorite episodes of Happy Days. What was that experience like? Oh, that was a blast. That was just an absolute blast. I, um, um, I, you know, I, I was an adult by this point. Mm-hmm. I was in college, I think. And um, I, I, my, my half, my stepbrother, mm-hmm. um, my stepbrother, um, was um, a regular on Happy Days, mm-hmm. and I used to play on the Happy Days softball team. Wow! I knew a lot of, but before I even did an episode, so I knew a lot of the um, the cast members. Yeah, I knew a lot of the characters, a lot of the actors. Aaron Moran and Scott Baio, and yeah, all of that, and I knew some of the crew. So it was so fun to work on that episode. Plus, um, Kathy Silvers played Jenny Piccolo, mm-hmm. and um, she, um, her father was the guest star on that on that. Phil show. Silvers, yeah. Yeah, playing her dad. Yeah, you. Know what I like about it is that. <laughs> The tender moment between him and Kathy um, at, at the end, near the end, it always brings tears to my eyes because I, I don't know what kind of a father he was. I imagine not a good one because a lot of those old Borscht Belt comics uh, were not good family men. But I, I will tell you this, though. When I see them, you know, interacting with each other on screen near the end, it's it's almost like on Golden Pond when Henry and Jane Fonda are having, like, a, a conflict resolution. It just, like, it reminds me of the same thing when I see that. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. And so that was a kind of a privilege to be on that episode with Phil Silvers, you know, with his daughter. I, I had a blast. I had so much fun. I had also screen tested for that role of, of not Jenny, but for for Joni for the role that Aaron Moran got. Mm-hmm. Um, but they went, and I looked like Ron Howard. I had his coloring, his hair, and his freckles, and and Aaron looked like the dad um, yeah. more. And um, Tom Bosley. Um, yeah, and she was cast on that role. Uh, and you mentioned on Golden Pond. There's so many degrees of separation here my my brother brad actually before they made the movie mm-hmm. it was a, it was a play yep. um at the dorothy chandler pavilion uh and brad played um the, the, the grandson mm-hmm. um in the play and it was with charles Durney, i believe oh yeah um, at, at, at the uh down at the music center Chris, um, christopher plumber and, and, and uh, james earl jones they've done it on stage <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, uh, Marion Ross. I I I was so lucky to interview her back in 2020 and and stuff. Do you do you remember anything about her on set? Yeah, not really because we didn't have any scenes together. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, I was I was with Joni 
uh, or Jenny and Joni, and then another actress that played another, uh, we were um, uh, sorority girls. And um, and so all my scenes were, e- were either at Jenny and, at the house, but with just Jenny and Joni. Yeah. Or, or down at the, you know, at the, the little cafe or whatever it was, the coffee shop. And um, so I didn't have any scenes with her. I mean, I, I saw her on set. Um, but I didn't actually uh, have scenes with her. Oh, uh, Jerry Paris uh, directed. Uh, I did a I did a tribute interview uh, with his daughter a few years ago. Oh, that's so amazing! How many years have you been doing this, Tommy? Seven years. And you? How many? I'm just. How many? Do you know how approximately how many per year you do? I don't know how many a year. I mean, I do do a count at the end of every year and stuff. I can't remember all of them, but it's a lot each year. <laughs> What's the most you've ever done, if you can remember, or just a ballpark? Oh, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I can tell you the least amount. That was the first year in 2017 because I, I started in May, and by December I probably had maybe 35-ish. Oh, my God. Do you do one a week or, or more or less or... Well, at that time, I did one a week because I had trouble. But uh, since like m- like sometime in 2018, I've I, I've got one almost every day now. Sometimes uh, a couple times a day, depending on what's going on and stuff. You know, I try to not do as many in one day and stuff. But sometimes you just can't avoid it because of the other person's schedule. You know, I prefer to I prefer to do one a day. But you know, sometimes yeah. sometimes you don't know oh what's going to happen. Gosh, that's really. Um, amazing. That, I'm so impressed by that. Really, really, that's really, really incredible. Um, good for you. That you're, you're, you know, you're a good person to do this job because you sure know your stuff. You sure know your history, and you know the names. And um, yeah, I mean. I, I, I think my mom, you know, she worked for the cable company. We had every channel. We we took regular trips to the video store and the movies. It's just, it's always been a part of yeah. my life, you know. Where, what part of the country do you live in, Tony? Currently, I live in Modesto, but I'm originally from San Francisco. Yeah, okay, so you're here on the West Coast. That's fantastic. Well, good for you. That's yeah. wonderful. Yes. So now we get to Friday the 13th, part three. I started watching these movies when I was eight. I used to watch them when my parents were asleep. And I fell in love with Adrian King in the first one. And then I started, yeah. I st- then each sequel I saw, there was always one girl I fell in love with. And you were definitely mine for three. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was really, um, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how happy I am that I had that experience. Um, at the time, I didn't even know what I was getting into. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, I was uh, getting ready to go away to college, and I was, uh, you know, ready to quit the business and um, um, move, you know, back to, to Michigan. And um, I went on the interview, and... Uh, actually, my mom. My mom by this time she became an agent when I was um, 16, so she didn't represent me as a child, you know, as a little girl. Got it. But yeah, but but when I was at 16, she was representing me at least theatrically, not for commercials. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she said, "Hey, they're making this movie. Um, I'm going to send you out on it." And I'm like, "Oh, mom, you know, I'm leaving. I'm moving away. I really." She goes, "Oh well." You know, it's going to be shot near Simi Valley, and um, it's shot this summer, so you don't have to miss college. And um, you know, I think you should uh, you should give it a go. And so, um, so I did, and um, um, got the part. But again, I didn't even know um, how incredible it would turn out to be. And you know, we're talking. 52 years later, people are still talking about it, and I'm doing, I'm going to horror conventions, and people still know everything about it, and know the dialogue, and are excited about it, and there's new generations of horror fans that come along, who know all the movies, and all the characters, and, um, you know, it, 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 it's larger than life, it is, it was, not something at the time that I thought would be, I, I just thought it was going to be a way to help pay for um, my, my education at University of Michigan. And, um, I, you know, I, I 
I needed money for tuition. And mm -hmm. so that's really, at the time, all I thought about. And then when I, um, when I actually um, became a news reporter right out of college in, I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I got my first job in Toledo, Ohio, just down the road from Ann Arbor. And I really kind of downplayed my act. I didn't mention my acting career. I wanted to be taken seriously as a journalist. And right. although I was just a kid, I'd just gotten out of college, I had worked at the campus radio station at Michigan, and I'd studied journalism and journalism law and ethics and, you know, knew, learned how to write and so learned how to tell stories with pictures. And so I didn't talk about my acting career at all, and it really didn't even come up for many years because I kept it pretty, you know, no one in, in Ohio would imagine that the, the girl that's reporting on the local township trustee meeting or school board meeting or fire in a neighborhood business was the same girl that starred in a horror film mm -hmm. you know, a few years earlier. I kept it pretty low key. And it wasn't until I was in Dayton, Ohio, about two years after I got out of college. Well, it was a couple years after. I was there for four years. So it was you know, maybe four years, five years after I did the movie that somebody figured it out and they, um, they ran a, a story on me um, in the local paper, you know, that I was in Friday the 13th. And, um, but it, it was for a few years, for many years, I just, and even when I moved to LA and I was a news reporter and anchor in Los Angeles, again, I didn't really make a big deal out of it. I, I kind of wanted to just stay low profile, yeah. not, you know, because I didn't want to get uh, confused <laughs> with my broadcast, my journalism work as a journalist. Um, but now, you know, all these years later, 42 years later, um, or 41 years later, I, I love it. And I'm thrilled that I was in the movie. And I, mm. and I, I love going to... Um, the cons. Yeah, I love going to the, the um, <laughs> conventions and meeting people and... And I, and I'm a, now I'm a college professor, and my my students um, love to hear that I was in this movie because they know about it. Because I mean, they don't know about Little House, by the way. They have, most of them have never most of them have never heard of Little House on the Prairie, but they have heard about the Friday the Thirteenth, and so it's fun. They enjoy knowing that their teacher, um, you know, was in a horror film. They they get they get a laugh about that so yeah uh, that, so that, that's that's pretty that's pretty cool uh, that is let, let, let's see i've talked to david kadams funny guy i love his electrocution scene in the movie it, it cracks me up every time i see it um marilyn poucher who played mrs Voorhees uh, on the boat with data kimmel i talked to her. her her daughter told her she'd be a fool not to do my podcast <laughs> oh that's so nice yeah and do, 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 do you remember uh terrence mccory He was he was Steve he was Steve Miner's assistant and he played the young deputy at the end. Okay, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't really remember him too much. I, um, you know, we we probably didn't have you know like if he was a deputy, we didn't have scenes together. No, but he remembers um, something about you. He said, oh. he said that Tracy was a real tomboy and she could throw a football like nobody's business. <laughs> That's hysterical! Oh my gosh! Well, I was pretty athletic as a, as a little girl. Yeah. And, um, and I did have a pretty good arm. And Rosie Greer, the football player, yeah. and my brother Brad and Mark, both my brothers, did a movie in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the actors, and my brothers were the actors. And um, and Rosie kind of taught me how to throw a football. Oh. So I, 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 my whole life, I've known how to throw a football. Um, so that's funny that he would even remember that. I guess we must have been on set... Uh, you know, tossing the football around. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's super cool. I he, love that. He he's done a couple conventions, but he says he hasn't seen you at them yet. Yeah, does he do the horror conventions? Yeah, yeah, because because uh, he worked on this. He worked on Nightmare on Elm Street and a few others. Because yeah, he 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 got lucky and was doing like assistant work on on horror movies, and sometimes he would be like a background player or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's cool. That's really neat. I did not, uh, I did not know that. Did did that yo-yo hurt? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Yeah. No. It, it was, it was pretty, they were pretty gentle. Uh, it was not planned, though, I can tell you that. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, it was, it was not planned, for sure. They gave you some great lines in the movie that I want to bring up. That that one line uh, was it you, me, or the hammock? Was was was, De- oh, yeah. was Debbie asking him who orgasmed first? I, that's how I always let's perceived not, it. Let's not go there. I'm not going to get into that. But <laughs> uh, it is it is one that I um, I tend to uh, repeat. Like I'll sign autographs, and that's one that I'll write. Um, you know, on the uh, I'll write that on the. Uh, uh, their picture, you know, when I'm signing it. And yes. I love that. <laughs> and then you you say, I'm going to go take a shower. You should try it sometime. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you say that in such a Tracy Savage-like way. Like, I can imagine in hindsight that you were going to be a reporter because I, I, yeah, I don't know if Debbie is generalizing it or telling him he stinks. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was probably more of the second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Was there a long discussion before filming of, about the shower scene? Well, yeah, kind of. Um, you know, I was uh, I was a kid, and so I'm having to kind of navigate something that was kind of tricky. Um, you know, like as I was, I was 19, eighteen or nineteen years old, and. Um, I'm having to talk to the producer and director and say, look, you know, there's only certain things I'll do. I'm going to go off to college and get a career and started, and I don't want to ruin my career by, you know, doing something that's too, you know, trashy and that's going to impact my, my life. And so I kind of had to, at a, at a, at a young age, um, fend for myself. Like, in other words, I didn't have my mom there on set kind of advocating for me. I was barely an adult myself, but I had to kind of, you know, like put my foot down to certain things because, you know, I wanted to sort of save my dignity um, depending on, uh, you know, where I ended up uh, in my career later on. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, so, anyway. Yeah, well, you looked great in that, and I commend you for doing it. And you had a, um, a Kevin Bacon-esque death, except the, the blood didn't squirt into your mouth like it did in his. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Yeah, it's did, pretty crazy. Did you know that a book just came out about part three? Yes, I'm going to give a shameless plug to another guest of mine, R.G. Henning. Uh, He wrote a book about part two that came out last year, and now he just came out with a part three book. Uh, He was scheduled to come on here last month, but uh, his book tour started earlier than he thought, so um, I'm waiting for to hear back from him. But it's called Jason 3D, a comprehensive expose on Friday the 13th, part three. And yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to uh, getting that one. What is his expertise? What is he? He's just a fan. Um, Okay, so the RG in his name stands for his real name, which I won't reveal. Uh, He's a a church minister, and if they found out that he wrote a couple horror books, they'd be upset. But yeah, he's just a a fan who, you know, he he loves part two and part three a lot, and so he decided to write some books about them. That is so interesting. Has he had success with the books? I imagine the first one did well last year. Yes, um, I'll, I'll ask him about that uh, when I talk to him. But um, it, it's funny. I connected him with Greg uh, to go on his show, and it, it turns out he actually um, wrote some quotes that somebody uh, said to him on his show about part two, and it was just a coincidence because you know he had to credit uh, Greg's show and stuff, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I mentioned his name in my book." <laughs> wow. Wow, um, that's so cool! I did not, I did not know that. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a great guy. So, 
As a journalistic reporter, I mean, you got to see many landmark things over time. I mean, there's the OJ trial, the Heidi Fleiss trial, the 1996 Summer Olympics, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. I mean, when you look back at everything you saw, both as an actor, as a reporter, can you pretty much say you've seen it all? I can't say I've seen it all, but I have, uh, you know, those were interesting times, and I've definitely, um, you know, experienced a lot and um, had an opportunity to be basically, as I, you know, as they say, the front row seat to history mm -hmm. um, for some pretty significant things in our history. Um, you know, uh, OJ was 30 years ago, and my students at where I teach college, they barely even know anything about it. They, you know, they kind of know a, a little bit about it, but they don't know. They have no idea that that trial lasted well over a year, I mean, with pretrial hearings, and it was almost a year and a half from the time the murders happened before we got the, um, uh, the verdict. And um, so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I would say I've had some really spectacular, interesting, uh, I've had an interesting career, that's, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just, it's just ironic, you know, that O.J. passed last week, you know. I mean, it's, that, was, that, was, that was the trial I thought that was never going to end. I thought, you know, God, it was going to go on forever. Yes, yes, I know. And it seems kind of anticlimactic that he would just die of prostate cancer and kind of just like it was a little bit of surprise that he was even that sick and now he's gone and, and you know... It, it, it is, it's kind of crazy, is really, it's just, it's, um, it's pretty wild that, uh, that he's gone and that really the, um, uh, it doesn't bring an end to all the changes that that trial brought and to its significance in history in terms of race relations and trial coverage and media and Los Angeles and, um, all of the significance that it had, um, but it is, uh, it definitely is an interesting passing that he's, he's passed away, and um, um, the whole thing, you know, certainly the whole thing was tragic, um, and, and there's still no justice for the victims, so that's kind of sad. Yeah. So do, do, when, you, when you teach, do you get a satisfaction teaching that you don't get when you're acting or reporting? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Reporting, when I first started in the business, uh, I worked in the middle of, I worked in the Midwest, and I covered, I covered things that mattered to people in these small towns, and, um, and I felt like it was a public service, and I really, it was really wonderful. Um, but then when I got to L.A. and I'm covering, you know, crazy trials that really kind of sensational things. It sort of lost its uh, altruistic feel, and I didn't feel like it so, was so much a public service as it was infotainment. And um, but now teaching, I'm back doing something that has, that has an absolute direct impact on the lives of people, and um, it it uh, you know I can help start careers for uh, for young people, and that really uh, a, a spectacular feeling and a um, it's just very very um, satisfying and, and it feels great and it makes me happy and proud and all those other things that is so awesome so so was it Mike Goodridge who uh, lured you back to acting uh, yeah, yes and no I mean I, I've been in LA um, for a few years before I met Mike, and I had done back in L.A. after being in the Midwest as a mm. reporter. And I had done um, uh, a couple of TV shows, Eight Simple Rules for Mer uh, Dating My Daughter and Monk. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and a show called First Monday where I played uh, news reporters. And mm. so I'd already been doing a little bit, you know, not a ton, but enough. Um, that, um, 
you know, I, I, it's, it's, um, so I'd already done a little bit, but certainly Mike, uh, you know, I did a couple of horror films with, uh, you know, with, with him, mm -hmm. and, and that really got me back to doing that kind of stuff, so, um, so yeah, it was fun. Well, I saw The Bone Garden, and I love it, and I talked to your good friend Tammy Cates recently. I just adore her. I mean, yeah. we're both Geminis, and we both love manifesting our freaky sides and what we do professionally, so I got along great with her, and um, she told me how much she loves you, and I, I got to tell you, you know, when you two were, were out cougaring at the bar <laughs> in the movie, I was just so happy because I love older women, and I have my whole life oh, and stuff. That's awesome. Real quick, I just want to tell you, you know, I loved your performance in 13 Fanboy. Greg and I were both contributors of that movie. And I thought you and Lar Park Lincoln were the best things about that movie. And uh, do you have any upcoming uh, con appearances or movie roles? Well, I do, actually. I am, um, um, I've got, I'm going to do like four or five cons this Year. I'm gonna. They're mostly um, Days of the Dead, and I'm gonna be in Phoenix, and I'm gonna be in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. be in Houston, and I'm gonna be in Niagara Falls, and then I'm doing a Little House convention in Connecticut. So I'm actually gonna be pretty busy this. Uh, pretty busy this year. Well, if you ever get booked for a con in California, you know, I will definitely show up if I can um, because I would love to meet you and I can't tell you what an honor this has been. I'm so glad Greg could connect us. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Tommy. I so, uh, it's been a blast and I'm really impressed with uh, your knowledge. It's beyond anything I've ever seen. Um, so I'm going to keep you in mind when we get to putting our book together, I may hunt you down and have you be a consultant. Um, yes. Because I, I, you know, to help us find those connections um, that you seem to know a lot about. So that's super cool. I would love that. Thank you so much, Tracy. Have a great rest of your day and be safe. Thanks. You too, dear. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Tracy Savage, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my God, I absolutely loved her. She was awesome, and I'm so glad we could have a great conversation like that today. And yes, I would love to be a consultant on the book. You know, when or if they do it, I think they should. I think they got a great story. The Three Savages and their own three little chapters, that would be so awesome. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!